India may be an extreme case of the phenomenon, but the rate of female labor force participation is lower than the male rate everywhere in the world. Perhaps the most important reason for that is that across the world, women disproportionately bear the burden of care work and domestic work. Hello and welcome back to the first module of this course on decent work for women. In this video, we will learn more about the unequal burden of care work. Just one thing, it's really important when we're looking particularly at gender and inequality and work is always to get the kind of back, backdrop to this, which is the um, very long standing in, in virtually all societies, the gender division of labor, um, which is a socially, socially configured gender division of labor where the primary responsibility of women is seen as being in the household um, for reproductive labor, often unpaid um, and certainly undervalued um, in terms of, of the worth that society puts on it. Um, and uh, men's primary responsibility, and put those in, in inverted commas, um, is in paid work um, and, and, and traditionally often being seen as the primary breadwinner um, uh, in the household. Um, and that, that that gender division of labor, I think, is, is con continued even in the modern, modern workplace and in the way in which work's evolved. Um, if we think we, we go back um, more historically when, when you had less technology, when life could be harder and, and, and many countries still is very hard, that gender division of labour um, often persists um, and some of the rationale for it um, is things like, well, men have to do the more physical work, although I've seen plenty of women who do some pretty physical work, particularly when looking after children carrying large loads, etc. Um, but those were the kinds of rationale that was that was put forward, and, and it's also socially, uh, and that varies a lot by society. There are sort of social rationale for why women should have certain roles, caring roles, and men more of the kind of physical roles in, in the workplace. So that's background. So. Globally, women and girls perform the bulk of unpaid care work uh, across, I mean, you know, uh, across countries, across societies and communities. That's the way it is. Women and girls perform the bulk of unpaid care work. But this is even more so in India, where, we, where they put in 3.26 billion hours of unpaid care work each and every day, and which contributes to about roughly about 10% of the economy. Now, the tragedy is that all this is unrecognized and unaccounted for in systems of national accounting. In other words, uh, this work often very laborsome and backbreaking is not considered as formal productive labor. Yet it is the backbone on which our economic systems work. So in other words, women and girls unpaid labor is a huge hidden subsidy to the economy you know i mean the fact that say a man can comfortably get to a factory and start working is because there is a woman behind him who is taking care of his house who's cooking his meals who's taking care of his children and elderly cleaning after him all of that that woman is doing because of that he can leave on time and get to his workplace in time and start working had that not happened, he wouldn't have been able to juggle, which is actually the reality of so many women in our country. Now, it is unequal because, first of all, it is unrecognized and unacknowledged, as I just mentioned. But the second part is that because it is very disproportionately uh, tilted in towards women, the burden is almost entirely on women and girls to do it, and men do nothing. So in India, the first time you survey was done in 1998-99, which kind of records over a 24-hour period how much care, different kinds of work does a woman and a man do. Now, it's taken 20 years since then for the next time you survey to come up by the National Sample Survey Organization. And this shows that women perform 10 times more unpaid labor than the men in our country. What this means is that women are chronically, and especially poor women, are chronically uh, 
uh, time poor, by which we mean that they deny the opportunities to pursue studies, choose the kind of employment they would like to uh, do, take care of their health and find time for leisure and rest. And yes, the last one about taking care of leisure and rest is a crucial aspect of a person's well-being. So this triggers of a vicious cycle where young girls drop out of education to help their mothers with the uh, care work uh, at a young age. They drop out of school and they stop going to school completely. Uh, they take care of their younger siblings doing the cleaning and the, sometimes they also fetch water and firewood. Once they drop out of school, they lose out on essential life skills for employment. As a result, they are only equipped to take on low-paying, insecure, mostly part-time <coughs> jobs in the informal sector with no social security benefits or for that matter, job security. Um, and uh, as they grow up, uh, they start their own families and their uh, unpaid care duties uh, increase with uh, time and age. And once they get married and move into their marital homes, etc., and with no one to help them with that work, the expectation being that they will do all the work themselves, they have to settle for less lucrative jobs, which allow them to juggle their care responsibilities with their other duties. Women from somewhat better off uh, families drop out of workforce. Now, this is a peculiar phenomenon in India where with improvement in financial resources of the families, women drop off the workforce. In poorer families, women have no other option but to keep working because that is a question of sustenance. And with little education and no employable skills uh, and high burden of unpaid care work because they cannot afford to outsource that care work, poor women are forced to take up low-paying, unskilled, insecure jobs where they are exploited by their employers. Women are paid lower wages than men, have little scope for growth, and uh, will be the first to be laid off when an economic crisis or a shock hits, uh, such as we saw during the pandemic or demonetization. So thus, unpaid care work is... I mean, what I consider as the root of gender inequality in the labor market and employment opportunities. And a recent study shows that in households where women earn more than men, across all education levels, it doesn't matter whether they're illiterate or they, you know, if they're, if they're uh, in, in skill, skill professions, the, the likelihood of them being in intimate partner violence or in domestic violence is significantly higher, right? So um, we also know in the whole neoliberal economic model, there's been a transition from, uh, there's been a, you know, sort of a regression of moving back to the male breadwinner model, right? Uh, because as, as workplaces become more demanding, not just for women, but both men and women, families in the absence of care or in the presence of compromised care, choose a model where they would where the woman will stay at home and the man will work and so what's really happening uh, so that's something you see in india you know along with the neoliberal model of economic development households make these decisions right households decide that women will not work they will become you know so there are all these interesting terms they they will become uh, they will undertake family production they will engage in family productivity there's also this thing of status production, right? So there's someone called Hannah Papenek who's talked about status production. So what is status production? It's really interesting. So, you know, status production is when a woman is contributing uh, by her labor, contributing to increasing the status of the family, enhancing the status of the family by her labor in the household, which does not necessarily mean that there's an increase in her own status, right? So. And, and you know this is something which is which is coming from the lens of the community and th so the idea that so the point i'm trying to make is that very often we sort of leave the household out of the equation the public policies leave households out of the i mean it's very hard i mean to sort of mediate policy 
in the realm of the household is very hard. But we definitely know that, you know, households which tend to be more egalitarian are spaces where women are more likely to work. Households which follow the male breadwinner model, uh, model are spaces where women are less likely to work. And also, you know, these household ideologies are mediated by the economic condition of the, 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 the state of your economy. So, and it's not that they don't change. So for instance, when you're in a pandemic like now, and households have to make very difficult decisions about who's going to do care. Women will leave their jobs. Women will be more likely to, uh, women will more likely leave their jobs if they're not in an egalitarian situation. And unfortunately, we don't really sort of, you know, shift our gaze to this because the household is a very uncomfortable site to study, right? Um, and largely this, and when you're at a level, when you're at that level of graduate and above, right? How is it that you are going to push women to work if they themselves think that they shouldn't be working? Um, and so in, in this context, public policy can play a role by the, by the examples I give, giving childcare. We also know in India, we've legislated this. So apparently in the maternity, the new maternity law, there is one clause that you need to have a childcare facility within two kilometers of the workplace or in the workplace. How many, uh, you know, how many organizations really do that? So, and this is something, I, I mean, I think this is something we really need to look at, at a, uh, you know, need to sort of focus on as far as women's work is concerned, because we're not talking about spaces of poverty. We're not, we're talking about women coming from affluence and women coming from, from high education, proxied by high income, and then are working. And when you, you also see, so there's some more work done around NSS data, which clearly shows that household's level of income, a husband's education status, both of these are very important, important factors in explaining women's workforce participation. So the, the more educated a husband is, less likely a woman is supposed to work. So you know, you, you get sort of, you're getting these very regressive, uh, very regressive empirical uh, um, findings as far as why women are not going to the workforce. So we're not even talking right now. We haven't even started talking about what the structure of, uh, you know, what the nature of jobs is and so on and so forth, right? So far, we have learned that women bear the burden of unpaid care work almost entirely and that there is no formal recognition of the work that they do in the home. This has an impact, not just on whether women are part of the labor force, but also on what kind of work is available to them. Now before that, I'd like to talk, you know, tell you a little story about this young girl called Preeti in Bangalore. Uh, she managed a three-month skilling course and landed with a retail job in a high-end brand store. So she got married and had a child. And unfortunately, her mother-in-law fell ill and there was no one to take care of her baby and her ailing uh, in-law. So she, with, there was no flexibility in her job space, so she had to quit her job. And then she was forced to uh, take care of her family. Now, this is not a one-off story. This is actually the story of millions of women in our country. And the NSS 68th round, which was the 2011-12, shows that sectors that attract maximum women are agriculture, manufacturing, especially food and textile manufacturing, and in the services sector, education and retail. Now, this is likely because these sectors are also the fields where they've traditionally been more aligned to society's expectations of women working. So a teacher is acceptable for a woman to work. Whereas, um, uh, you know, working as a driver or a carpenter or a mechanic or other forms of manufacturing or in the construction sector, you won't see that much presence of female employees, if at all, any. Um, now, I think what happens here is that social norms play a very critical role in the types of employment that women can take up. And besides, don't forget that women in these sectors are the luckier ones because they would have probably received a more decent education because of which they're able to take up these kinds of jobs, like a high-end retail brand store. You will not be able to do, uh, if, you, if you're only a class 12 
pass or uh, class eight drop out. So because of this, and also because of the support of their families, you know, I mean, that's a very important thing that, you know, women who can work are women whose families have stood by them, but that's not the case for a lot of women. But nonetheless, they're still vulnerable to the whims and fancies of the sentiments of the family and can be withdrawn at any moment from their work. But I think really it's important to remember that the whole world of work has changed. So, so what we have now, particularly in higher income economies, but also increasingly in lower income countries. So, you know, you, you do have to, to differentiate but there's much more technology, there's much more innovation, and that innovation can even be at quite a basic level of people having mobile phones, being able to communicate, um, et cetera. Um, and there's been, particularly with liberalization um, since the 1980s, there's a much more flexible labor markets, labor market deregulation. So women have been brought more and more into um, paid work into uh, from unpaid into paid work and part of that um, I would argue has been the commercialization of the types of roles that women have traditionally done so women particularly cons um, traditionally in the home they've looked after children they've cared for elderly dependents um, they've often been responsible for educating children um, they, they make the food, they make the clothing, etc. But as those activities have been commercialised, women have been drawn into paid work doing those similar activities. Um, but in being brought into paid work, um, that work is often undervalued, they're low paid, they can work very long hours, um, uh, they often have poor rights and conditions, so women are particularly concentrated um, in, in, in um, for example, in the UK, in COVID, in care homes, in nursing, in teaching, and these are all low paid activities. Um, uh, but also on top of that, because that gender division of labour has kind of come into the sphere of paid work, being replicated to some extent at least with changes in in the sphere of paid work and by the way i think it's a big advance that women do enter paid work because it gives them greater independence they're more able to make choices but those choices are continue to be limited and undermined by the fact that that their work is of lower pay is deemed of lower value even though it's absolutely critical to society and, and a key factor in all of this um, is that women are constantly, much more than men, women continue to take the primary responsibility for unpaid work within the home, even when they're in jobs, paid jobs. So they will go back and do the majority of the housework, of the childcare, of the caring for relatives or dependents within their own home. So they're constantly juggling the paid and unpaid types of work, which puts a lot of pressure on women um, both within the workplace but uh, paid workplace but also when they return home in terms of long hours stress um, etc and i think that's a really important backdrop to, to this sort of changing nature of work um, to understand the kind of gender dimension of it um, and, and why uh, and why we need to really think about gender specifically when we try to address things like workers rights so one thing that i wanted to talk about was um, uh, you know the, the i mean whether businesses and employment practices increase the burden of care work now i mean to address this question one has to kind of flip it around a bit um, the main concern really is on the question of quality of employment you know um, the op basically the opportunity cost for women to remain in employment is so high vis-a-vis -vis some of the other work they do especially the care work that they do that they often drop out of employment now women have to undertake disproportionate burdens of unfair care work irrespective of their caste and class and this is a given fact now, as a result, they have to adjust their work schedules to accommodate their unpaid care duties. 
Now let me share some data with you. The amount of time devoted to unpaid care work is negatively correlated with female labor force participation. So for example, in countries where on an average a woman spends five hours doing uh, um, unpaid care work, 50% of women of the working age population are in the workforce. That is women who are either employed or looking out for work. Now, in countries where women spend three hours on unpaid care work, 60% of women are in the workforce. So you see a 10 percentage point increase in women's labor force participation if you decrease women's unpaid uh, care work time uh, substantially. Now, secondly, gender inequalities and unpaid care is also linked to gender gaps and labor force participation. So, for example, the higher the inequality in distribution of care responsibilities between women and men, higher the gender gaps in labor force participation. For example, in countries where women spend almost eight times the amount of time on unpaid care activities than men, they represent only 35% of the active working population. So, imagine the situation in India where women perform 10 times unpaid care work than men perform and women's participation in the labor force is only 27 percent so when gender inequality in time devoted to unpaid care work increases female employment situation uh, is relative to the male one for uh, worsens um just to carry on within the workplace um Another dimension just is to look at globalization and how that's changed the nature of work. And what we saw particularly from the 1980s was um, a big um, outsourcing, in inverted commas, of production from the leading uh, higher income countries, North America and Europe particularly, <coughs> to lower income countries. So things like garment production, a lot of labor intensive production, electronics, um, footwear, et cetera, et cetera, or outsourced to, to lower income countries and, and food production as well. And women in those countries were drawn into the labor force in order to produce for um, the global value chain, for the global economy. Um, often for exports, but increasingly for within their own production and sale within their own region. And again, women have been brought in as a sort of low, uh, low, uh, low cost labor force um, in, in things like garments, producing very, um, uh, playing a significant role in the economy. But take an example is Bangladesh, uh, 4 million workers, 60 to 70 percent of them are women. Um, the, the Bangladesh uh, garment sector, ready-made garment sector, is critical to the Bangladesh economy. Yet women um, are, are low paid, work very long hours, often very exploitative conditions, um, lack organisation. Um, on paper they have rights, but in reality those rights are often negated. So women face a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, um, uh, in terms of, of, of how they enter the workplace, place, the conditions under which the majority of women um, work and the, the um, ability to organise as well um, uh, uh, within the workplace. Let us just recap what we have learned so far in this module. Perhaps the most important reason why women participate in the labour force at rates that are lower than that of men is that they disproportionately bear the burden of care work. In India, where women spend so much more time than men in providing care at home, their participation in the labor force is substantially lower. We also learnt that the work that is available to women, especially in countries where they bear a high burden of care work at home, is often precarious and exploitative. We also noted the role of global supply chains that seek out the cheap labor of women in developing nations. Such work often falls within the category known as informal work. We will learn more about this later in the course, but put simply, workers have little or no social security that is linked to their work. In the next video, we will learn more about the conditions under which 
women perform the kinds of work that are available to them. Thank you for watching.